Heenan Blakey was, for more than 40 years, one of Canada's big, powerful law firms. Starting from a small office in Montreal, it spread from coast to coast, employing hundreds of lawyers, including former Prime Ministers Pierre Trudeau and Jean Chrétien. Then, one day, in February 2014, it was all over. Norman Bacall was national co-managing partner at the firm, and he details the incredible demise in his book, Breakdown, the inside story of the rise and fall of Heenan Blakey. And it brings him to our studio tonight. Norman, it's great to meet you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Steve. Same here. I want to start with, I don't mean this to sound as sort of uh, provocative as it may sound, but I, I want to get a better understanding of why you're the best guy to tell this story. Normally, when something like this happens, you know, you want a sort of a neutral third-party observer to be able to talk to everybody and then synthesize it all. You were a player. You were inside it all. So you have your views, shall we put it. Did that concern you at all in the telling of the story? Interesting. Uh, first of all, Steve, I did not set out to write a book. The writing process, which had, the original manuscript was a, close to 900 pages handwritten, was a way for me to process my anger and my hurt and all the feelings I couldn't deal with. Uh, for anyone who's been through a breakdown or a collapse, whether it's business or personal, uh, you can understand there's, it, there's a great feeling of loss. This well, you was, say it's like a death in the family. Death in the family. And it was my family. It was a family I grew up with. I spent my, virtually my entire adult life there. So it was, from my perspective, I needed to process my grief and my anger. And writing was the, the method by which I did it. And frankly, it was my wife who encouraged me to do it because I think I was walking around a very angry man. So this was somewhat cathartic to do this. Completely. That was the origins of it. In terms of when did it become a book, I can't exactly say. I decided it went from catharsis and the anger started to drain out of me to here was something I'd spent 25 years building uh, from the day I moved to Toronto in 1989. From Montreal. From Montreal. And I looked at it and said, well, there are no bricks and mortar anymore. Nothing I can show my children, my grown-up children in terms of what I've accomplished, that you know, this is what daddy left behind. There was nothing left. And I said, well, you know, at the very least, I have some memoirs. And because I'd written down virtually every story I could remember from, from the time I was a student in law school right through till, till the very end. So that process took me on a, a longer road. And then I, I took the manuscript. Uh, typed it up, sent a couple of chapters, one, one of them to a Hollywood client of mine who was a film producer. Because uh, you were kind of an entertainment lawyer. I was an guy. entertainment lawyer. I represented a whole bunch of them in lots of studios. And so I sent it to Bob Cooper, who for a while ran HBO uh, in, its, in its earliest days, and sent it to a Toronto agent. Uh, the, it was interesting. My, the, the Hollywood producer actually sent back some script notes, said, it's interesting. <laughs> And here are some things you need to think about. Yeah. And the agent said, call me back when you got it down to 300 pages, because no one is going to read more than that. And, and you then did. it became a project. Yeah, yeah, got it. Um, well, let's tell some of the story here. And the fact is, it's going to make a great movie someday, because it does read like <laughs> a bit of a whodunit here, right? At its height, Heenan Blakey was doing how much business a year, dollar-wise? We, we were a quarter of a billion dollar business. $250 million a That's year. Right. Can you, I mean, as you've gone back to look at the record of how this firm went from $250 million a year to dead, you know, as we say in the sports world, where's the TSN turning point? Uh, we're at only one. I, I think there were a series of things that happened. And, and I, I'm fairly careful in the book. Once I processed my anger where, where I blamed everybody but me, I got to the point where I had to sit down and, and do... Uh, a more thorough and an attempt at a much more objective analysis as, as to how something like this could happen. Mm -hmm. And equally importantly, what was my role in it? Because I'd run the firm fairly efficiently for about 16 years, along with uh, my co-managing partner, Guy Tremblay in Montreal. It was a wonderful relationship. This was a we Toronto, Montreal Toronto, Montreal situation. Montreal were the two core offices of a, of a law firm that had almost 600 lawyers at its, at its height. Offices in Paris. We 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 experimented all over the world, so it was a. Uh, but but our term was coming to an end. Uh, according to our firm governance, we needed to be replaced, and which should have been a healthy process. We didn't handle that transition very well. In fact, we handled it exceptionally poorly. Do you know why? A number of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, the chairman of the firm and the founder, Roy Heenan, I think suffered from some of the things that 
owner founder firms suffer from, and that is uh, the founder doesn't know when it's time to hang up the cleats and, and call it a career. Uh, he was phasing himself down, but he insisted on running the succession process. Probably a bad idea. Uh, not because he didn't follow the process, a very good process, he did. But Roy was a terrible manager, a brilliant legal mind, a fantastic, one of the best law labor lawyers in the country, probably in the history of Canada, but an awful manager and a terrible internal communicator. Just, not his just, skills. Just curious, he, 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 and he recently passed away. Do you know if yes. he read the book? He did, definitely did not read the book. He didn't, okay. He did not read the book. And, uh, and, and maybe just as well, Roy didn't, Roy didn't like to be criticized, although I think for anyone who reads it, you'll see uh, I have a deep love for Roy yeah. and a great abiding respect for him and what, what he accomplished. But uh, managing was not one of his talents, which is why Guy and myself were there. So, but he insisted on running the process. As a result, a, a lot of partners were skeptical, felt they were out of the loop. Um, he, and, and I think he thought he'd come up with the best, he and his working group had come up with the best candidate uh, to replace Guy in Montreal. Uh, but the result was there was a backlash, some frustration, particularly in Toronto. There was an exacerbation of the normal tensions you see between uh, Quebec and the rest of Canada, and particularly uh, Toronto and Montreal. Uh, so this was a flashpoint for it, and Toronto Partners insisted that we have a vote for the second replacement managing partner, which I would say is probably the worst way to pick a leader. Uh, and I say the worst way because if you look at corporations and the processes they go through to hire, yeah, the players don't get a vote on who coaches the that's team. That's right. That's yeah. right. And normally you would look for a professional manager to run a 250 million dollar business. That thought would never occur, and not just to us, it would never occur to lawyers to do that. Why? Because part of it is lawyers who hubris. We all believe that we are smarter than everybody at everything. <laughs> and that includes the people that work for us. So we hire professional accountants, we hire marketing experts, uh, we hire assistants, and then we all believe we can do their job better than they can. And it's a, which makes managing lawyers the, the great challenge that it is. I wonder whether part, uh, you know, this, uh, that, Tons of good stuff in this book, but this, this quote really spoke to me as I, um, it's that evening where you're having a social event and everybody's sort of going around the table describing what they do for a living. And Roy begins by saying, Heenan Blakey is about the practice of law at the highest level in a collegial atmosphere among people who genuinely like working with one another. We take care of our clients and one another and let the bottom line take care of itself, which is a wonderful mission statement. Next guy who's asked says, we run a business with a view of maximizing our bottom line. And that was it. And I wonder whether you guys were, you know, just a bit too sweet to, to um, at the end of the day, um, make it in a world where, you know, they're all a bunch of sharks down there. Interesting that you say that. And a number of people have commented, particularly on that, that perhaps we couldn't keep up, but that the world had surpassed us. There might be some truth to that. On the other hand, we, ha we deliberately went out of our way to create a working environment where people mattered most. Where, and I saw it as a working experiment based on the lessons I learned from people like Peter Blakey and Roy Heen and Don Johnson, that coming, uh, being excited to come to work every morning was paramount. And that if we earned a little less money as a result, it was worth it. And that was the way we recruited. So I started a storefront in Toronto for lawyers, and we turned it into 200 lawyers. So, so the speech had to resonate over the years. It was very much, when I was recruiting it, it was to lawyers who were very unhappy where they were, very great lawyers, uh, virtually all of them. And I said, listen, we believe in excellence first, and second, I'm, your commitment to me and my commitment to you is that you're going to have fun. And it worked. People wanted to have fun. And if you interview, I, my guess is if you interview the lawyers, not only the lawyers, but the staff, I think if you interview virtually anybody that worked there, even people who lived through the collapse and the terrible tragedy and the anger and the pain, mm -hmm. what they will tell you, and I've heard this from, from many of them, is best working experience of my life. Yeah, um, until but, it wasn't, but, right? But, but could we sustain it? I genuinely believe we could have. Uh, we, re we replaced ourselves, and just get back, getting back to the point we were talking about before, we replaced ourselves with two managing partners with no management experience at all and put them into a perfect storm of bad circumstances, mm -hmm. just difficult economy, uh, some major files having come to an end. It was, they, they, they were facing some great challenges, but we had faced great challenges in the past. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, 
uh, law firm partnerships are kind of like marriages. They're based on trust and commitment to one another. And as soon as the trust starts to break down, I don't think it was about money in the end. I don't think the firm fell apart because we were earning a little less money. I think ultimately it fell apart because people started, stopped trusting one another and stopped having fun. And to that end, as I set up this next quote here, I mean, you, you got into a situation where it was almost like a run on the bank, right? Lawyers started leaving and leaving and leaving. And now, Sheldon, let's do the quote here from Norman Bacall's book. I no longer saw any way to save us. It was time to pull the life support plug. The patient had been mortally wounded and had to be allowed to die as swiftly as possible. I finally realized I'd been living in what some might describe as distorted reality, and I had managed to drag everyone along with me. I want you to take us to that moment when you finally realized it's dead. That's it. I can't save it. What was that like? It was uh, less traumatic than you would have expected. I was, this, this was the end of a six week period where I'd been, I'd just come out of knee surgery, a knee replacement surgery. So I was limping along and uh, in, a, in a fair amount of pain, but none of that mattered. It was days and nights of coming up with a, a effectively a rescue and survival plan. I just stepped, I'd been out of management completely for almost 14 months and I'd stepped back in. In some respects, and I don't mean to sound perverse, but it was the most energizing and enervating experience of my life. There was a chance, it was like I had the heartbeat of the firm in my hands, there was a chance to save it. And I think for anyone who's been through something like this, there's a part of your brain that is going through dissonance. You see all the negativity around you and you are convinced that you will somehow figure out the way to chart your way through it. And, and, and all I had to do was convince everyone, and literally everyone, that that's where we were headed. And, I th and, and by the way, we would have made it. We had three mega commercial files on the horizon. And nor normally you'd say there is a 10 to 15% chance uh, that any one of them will come in because you're competing with other firms. As it turned out, in hindsight, all three of those files came in. We would have had probably one of the best years in our history in 2014 had we hung together. But I couldn't get enough of the partners just to commit. I, all I asked for was 12 months. Just give me 12 months where no one else is going to leave. Mm. Because we, you, we had to, I had to uh, part, most of this was about re rebuilding internal morale. So I, I start, and I started with the staff, not with the partners. I started with the staff and I went to them and I said, that's it. The, the, the period of sand being kicked in our face is over. So no one is going to speak badly of this firm, either externally or internally. From now on, it's all positive, which is the way I ran the firm. We are going to recreate the environment in which we succeeded. And people, ultimately, people wanted to buy into that. Hmm. There are, uh, obviously, after so many years at the firm, people with whom you still had a relationship and you still love. And I have to assume that there are people who you still hate. Do you, uh, how many relationships did you lose over all this? I wouldn't say I hate anybody, believe it or not. Uh, I, once I processed my anger, I was able to see that everyone behaved in accordance with their nature. <laughs> Natures that I knew, that I grew up with, some, some of whom I dis disliked from time to time, I disliked some of the things they did, I loved them all. Anybody and I still shock do. you? Anybody shock you because you thought a, they'd be a team player and they turned out to be out, out for themselves? A few people disappointed me in the end, and a few people surprised me uh, with their, and I would say, extreme loyalty. And not just partners, but staff as well. Staff who could have jumped off the boat, taken jobs, and decided to stay to the bitter end because they felt a loyalty. Uh, I always believed in creating an organization where, uh, where because people mattered and because we felt an attachment, if I said, for the good of the firm, I need you to jump out this window, that they wouldn't ask questions, they'd simply do it. And mm -hmm. there were enough of those people still there at the end who will still say, best experience of my life. Why was it not an option, as so many other law firms have done over the years, to somehow uh, merge with a bigger international firm or hook up with another firm in Toronto? Why didn't that work? Uh, it's, first of all, we didn't want it. Huh. And this goes back to the early 80s. We had an opportunity to merge with, uh, with another major Toronto firm who were trying to build a national network. This goes back to the mid-80s. And, and Peter and Roy basically said, we didn't spend all, all this time, and this was the first 15 years of the firm's existence, to create Heenan Blakey to suddenly become firm brand X. Mm -hmm. We've had some discussions uh, over the course of time, and my conclusion, and Guy's conclusion at the time, was as long as Roy's name was on the door and Roy was working there, 
there was not going to be a merger. Mm. Uh, we, we were going to have to wait until the founder uh, hung it up, and at that point in time, we could discuss whether it made sense to expand internationally. We've talked about Roy Heenan already. Peter Blakey's still around. Yes. Peter Blakey is 80 years old almost. Uh, has he read the book? Uh, Peter has read the book. What does he think? He's, he, it's interesting because not all my partners, not all my former partners want to read the book. I think it kind of opens some old wounds and some won't read it on principle. And he said, an absolute must read. He said that? He said that. He said, I would recommend this highly to anyone. It's, and it's because in part the book, I think the book resonates. And it re resonates not just on a factual basis or, and on a leadership basis, but really on an emotional basis. I try and take the reader uh, through my development as a character. It's, it's almost like a novel where you're following a character who starts out being a very introverted tax nerd lawyer <laughs> and over time becomes a partner at a firm and ultimately uh, a leader of a firm and a builder. And you follow not only my successes, but I take you through my, my many failures. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You and, don't spare yourself. And not just what happened, but how I felt about it. Well, let's then in the last couple of minutes finish on this. Uh, Extremely difficult, I appreciate, to be able to sum up sort of what the big takeaway was, the big life lesson learned. But okay, let me put you on that spot. What was it? Two things. One, from a, from a leadership perspective, uh, I always firmly believe culture came, culture came first, before strategy. Building a culture and then basing a strategy on that. And then making sure that everything we did was consistent with the operating strategy. So your actions and your words have to be consistent. And that's what my, my wife always says. She says, actions and words. You say one thing, but you do another. <laughs> you don't mean it. You have, to, you have to mean it by what you do every day. So that's part one. And from a, from a building an organization perspective, you see some of the best organizations of the world, uh, like Google, like IKEA. They're built on a, a strategy that starts with what their internal culture is. And that's, that's where I think that's where we built it, and that's where we failed in the end. So that's part one. Part two is it's as much a story about anything else about suffering serious loss, and we all do. I mean, we all at some point in our lives lose something that we have to, and we have to process the loss and the anger and the feelings, and then we have to move on. And for me, this book, which is, you know, I, I was pleasantly shocked to see it it's become a Globe and Mail bestseller. Uh, this book for me was the process for me of moving on and taking new steps in, in a new life for me. Who's going to play you in the movie? Uh, I really want it to be Kevin Costner. <laughs> if you can get him, you'd be doing well. He'd be good. Break down the inside story of the rise and fall of Heenan Blakey. Norman, it's great to have you here at TVO. Thanks, Thanks so a lot, much. Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.